The Dharma, incomparably profound and infinitely subtle, is always encountered but rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma, incomparably profound and infinitely subtle, is always encountered but rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma, incomparably profound and infinitely subtle, is always encountered but rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. Hello everyone and Happy New Year again. Uh, it's uh, still the New Year season here in Japan. Just uh, made it here. Happy New Year, Chris. Good to see you. We're going to have a little talk so you can sit Zen or listen, but here you go. Take that. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Zenkon who suggested uh, that uh, at some point, uh, maybe we can focus on the wonderful traditional writing known as the Shinjin Mei, uh, which has many ways to translate it into English. Um, faith in mind, trust in mind. We'll talk about that actually not today, but uh, maybe after uh, looking at uh, the Shinjin Mei for uh, a couple of times, well, where does that name come from uh but i'm going to tell you i think it's uh, a key i don't want to say the key but a key to the mind of zazen it's over a thousand years old and when you read it you'll say ah this is shikantaza shikantaza reaches back to the earliest times of zen practice in china and we also have to recognize some aspects of where that Zen tradition came from. First off, who wrote the uh, Xinjin Mei? Um, it's, but that's probably not historically true. That's one of the things we now realize uh, we Zen folks say traditionally, but there's no real evidence for that. It may be uh, that it comes from a, another branch of the Zen tradition called the Oxhead, because this has been honored in the Zen world for over a thousand years. And I say when anything has been honored for over a thousand years, it doesn't really matter where it's come from or who wrote it. It's just good. And there's a reason for it. Uh, so. Whoever the author is, we bow and we say, thank you. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece. It's also a piece which quite frankly shows, I believe that when Indian Buddhism came to China, there was a very definite Taoist influence on Indian Buddhism. And this, shall we say, meeting of the Indian traditions and teachings and Chinese sensibilities and perspectives is where Zen came from. Now, I got to put a couple of asterisks. Um, there is a book, I believe, by a Mr. Hinson. Uh, and I, I've read this book. And basically, he makes the argument that Zen is just Taoism in Buddhist disguise. That's not true at all. Zen that we practice is Buddhism that reaches back to the earliest teachings of impermanence, what the Buddha taught about dukkha, the 
Eightfold Noble Path, all of that. And some people say, uh, Barbara O'Brien sometimes says this, no, no, it is very little Taoist influence. They just happened, to, they were translating the language, so they used some of the Taoist words, like Tao, the way. And uh, some of the other influences we'll see today when we read. And that's all. There's very little Taoist influence. And I say, no, that's not quite right either. There was more, uh, so how to say, when the Indian curry came to China, they definitely gave it a Chinese was it by by good fortune for us, many of the traditional Taoist teachings and the Indian Buddhist teachings fit together beautifully. They complemented each other, you know, complement with an E completed. They complemented each other. They enhanced each other. The Indian Buddhists were already teaching about emptiness and realizes, realizing this emptiness in our heart and what it is to give up desire. And then these perspectives that we'll see today are about putting down desire and about realizing emptiness, and they fit together beautifully for whatever reason. Now, not all Taoism is in Buddhism, by the way. Taoism is a really wild kind of wacky religion that has to do very often with life extension and people trying to be immortals and, and doing things in order to live uh, exceptionally long. And it's got a lot of magic to it. That Taoism is not what I'm talking about. There's a flavor of Taoism, uh, the subtle teachings, they're known as, that have to do with things like radical equanimity and uh, going with the flowness, the great cosmic flow, the Tao, and the force, whatever you want to call it, uh, and our harmonizing or uh, or throwing ourselves into it that corner of taoism is what we're going to see very clearly here merging very nicely with the traditional buddhist teachings about how to put down desire and how to be free of clinging and this type of thing okay i think that that is what we're reading and there's historical evidence, there are some Taoist writings like the Zhuangzi, that almost some of what we're reading today, the same lines are almost borrowed from them. And Master Dogen too, was very influenced by what we're going to read today. Several of the lines you will find are quoted almost verbatim in the opening to his famous Fukan Zazingi. I'll post a little of that later, but he was very familiar with this, and he was, when he wrote the Fukan Zazengi, also reflecting and uh, kind of uh, uh, working from, I believe, the Shinjin Mi, which is a very, very honored piece in our Zen traditions, especially Soto, and um, with good reason. Now, another thing about this is people say, is Zen a body practice? Something we just do physically. We sit, we breathe, we take a certain stance, we do our work, sometimes in the garden, and it's a, it's a physical practice. It's not a mental practice. I hear this. It's a practice of the body. And there are some people, I believe, in the Zen world who are more into the physical aspects of it not the, the thinking. They're into the physical posture. They're what I call sometimes the lotus posture fascists. We actually say, you know, just throw yourself into the posture. That's all it is. And just do this breathing technique, do this breathing. That's all. And you get the samadhi. And that's what we're here for. Or do your work, your samu, your physical labor, and just throw yourself into that, or your ceremony, throw yourself into the physicality, and then you'll realize this. And are they wrong? No, no. 
that is a real way of practicing zazen and so much of the monastic practice doing ceremonies doing samu cooking in the kitchen sitting zazen with nice posture is about that throw yourself into the dance of the body throw yourself into it the movement and i say lose yourself and find yourself again like a dancer who just becomes one with the dance they're absolutely right but there's also the mental aspect. Master Dogen has a wonderful passage in the Shobogenzo in which he says, there's zazen of the body, there's zazen of the, there's zazen dropping body and mind. And then he also says that there's zazen the dropping body and mind beyond zazen dropping in mind, which I think he means don't just get caught in the idea of it, really experience this. But what I'm trying to tell you is there's also zazen of the mind. There's also zazen where it, it has to do with how you use your brain and thinking, or better, non-use your brain and thinking in a certain way. There's both. There's a time to be just throw yourself into the physical action. But when we're out in the world and, and dealing with the complexities of life, you can't just be in the lotus posture. There is a mental, shall we say, these attitudes or perspectives or insights about how we encounter and flow with the world mentally. That is part of our practice. There's the body part, yes but there's also mental side. There's something about how we must use our thinking and brain and emotions. And that is what the Shin Shin Mei is mostly about that we're gonna to see today. It's teaching you about how to think, or shall we say non-think, how to have a certain radical equanimity when you encounter a life filled with things that, well, are quite pleasing sometimes and sometimes very much not. All right, so let's dive into this. We're going to spend a few months, not, not every day, I mean, these Zazen Kai, because it's a, it's a long piece. We may not get to the end because, frankly, the Shin Shin Mei makes the same point like, like I do, Jindo. You heard, you know, old Jindo. Right, Chris? Same thing every month. Why do I come here? Every same time. thing. Just phrases in a different way. Same lessons. It is going to see the same thing again and again. I don't know. After a while, we might say, yeah, and it just goes on like that. Or we might go to right to the end. We'll see where it goes. But the beginning is famous, brilliant, very Taoist in its uh, wording. Let's dig into it. The great way, it says right here, the Tao, the Tao. <laughs> First line. Huh? I think it's Chi Dao Munan. The great way is not difficult. How is my uh, very bad, right, uh, Brad? Chi Dao Bu Bu The great way is not difficult. For those who hold no preferences, when longing, that means desire, what you want, right? When longing and aversion, the things you don't want, the things you run away from, the things you dislike, right? When longing and aversion are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. There it is, the secret to Zen. But wait a second, and this is basically what's going to continue in the rest of the Shinjin Mei, this teaching. But wait a sec. Huh? First off, how can a human being who's not a rock, who's not a piece of wood, be without longings and aversions? And how can we have 
no preferences. When you figure out this, it's like one of those Chinese puzzle boxes that open. You know those boxes where you, you don't know how to open and then you, you realize there's one thing to slide here and you slide over there and it just pops open and you go, oh, it was kind of obvious. This is kind of mysterious. How can we human beings who must get up in the morning and decide, I want to get out of bed, I want to have breakfast and I'd like to eat cereal, I would not like to eat dirt for breakfast. I would prefer not to be bitten by a poison snake today. We have preferences and aversions where human beings in order to live. I want to get to work. I need to cook for the kids. We cannot be with we cannot. Chris, can we be without likes and dislikes and preferences in this life? Not so far. Not so far. Anybody here manage to live without any preferences at all? I think they would, it would be a kind of psychopathy. They would lock you in the funny house because you would be, it's called being, uh, I, I think one of those people, catatonic state, they have a trauma and they cannot function so much. They just shut off, you know? It would be something like that. You could not function without preferences. So what could he mean here? Notice this, he says, when longing and aversion are both absent, right? When you hold no preferences, everything comes becomes clear and undisguised. Took me a long time to get what this is about. Fortunately for you, I'm about to share it with you, but really you've all heard it before if you've been here before. Okay. Now, the first thing is great misunderstanding. I think when people try to approach this, they say, oh, wait a second, we can't be free of preferences and aversions and things like that. He must mean we just tone them down. Have light preferences and mild aversions and uh, we have preferences but we don't cling to them that's what he means and i'm going to say that's a little what he means but that is not ultimately what he means first off to do what i just said Yes, it's a definite part of our Zen way. Have preferences, hold them lightly. If they don't turn out, let them be, let them go. If you lose someone, shed a tear, but don't fall into despair. Hold your aversions lightly. If you fear something, fear it, but don't fall into panic. Try to keep it mild and calm. Yes, this is a very definite part of our Zen way. This is where the Indian Buddhism comes in. The middle way, the way of moderation. Yes, definitely. Have preferences, likes and dislikes, hold them lightly. Have choices that you must make, but don't cling to them so hard they strangle you and it becomes a life and death matter. I must get this, uh, whatever it is I want in life, I must get it or I'm going to this just collapse. No, we don't do that. We're Zen people. We say, I'd like this to be, and if it doesn't be, as the wonderful Bodhisattva Doris Day sang, que sera, sera, right? Or, let it be, let it be. I promised Chris that I wouldn't sing. You know, Kirk on the podcast, he won't let me sing. And you can tell why. But, you know, let it be. Yes, this is a definite. Khan is with us today. He's very sick. I'm sure he would prefer not to be. And he practices very hard, I'm sure, to hold all he's dealing with lightly to. Okay, 
and I bet you his great teaching he gives us all the time is his wrestling with his aversion to his illness, his trying to flow with conditions, and it's hard, right? All of us dealing with things, and it's hard. So this lesson of holding mildly to preferences, having dreams but not clinging and strangling themselves, strangling ourselves with our plans and our dreams for the future, planning for the future, but not living just for the future or fearing excessively the future, learning from the past, but not clinging to the past, digging up and wallowing in the past. Yeah, we don't do that. We're people of moderation. That perspective on the Shin Shin Mei is exactly right. But that's not the ultimate meaning here. His ultimate meaning is longings and aversions must be both absent in radical equanimity. We must have no preferences and accept all conditions precisely as they are. So how do we do that and function in the world? And here, though if you've been a regular viewer, you already know the answer, but here is where the Chinese puzzle box opens. The brain can do two things at once as one. And I will now demonstrate for you. Okay? Watch this. I can tap my head, rub my tummy at the same time. I can even stick my tongue out. And if I wanted to, I could get up and I could hop up and down. You may see this when we do the bunny hop later. I'll do all this. We can do two seemingly is the word incongruous, seemingly opposite, conflicting things at the same time. And it's true here for how we approach or experience life. I sometimes describe it. I wear glasses, if you can see. Vision, 3D vision comes because we have the left eye seeing from one angle, the right eye seeing from the other angle. When both eyes are open together, seeing the world from two different angles, we have clarity and our experience of depth in vision, right? Anyone? Uh, into the movies very recently seen avatar 3d they know what i'm talking about we see it from the red side the blue lens you put the red side on the right the blue lens on the left i think and you look at the glasses and voila 3d okay he's talking about that there is one way to see the world with radical equanimity and one way to experience a world of choices and decisions and things we love and things we fear and detest. And we encounter the world both ways at one, both eyes open. Both experiences in our heart at once. Of course, again, when you encounter the things you like and dislike in moderation, yes, that part is true. But at the same time, know the radical equanimity and acceptance of what is wholly flowing with what is so much that your desires are dropped and we call this dropping body and mind because it's the mind that clings and wants and desires when you put down those wants and desires that is mind dropping do this at once and that's what you're going to hear him actually saying in a bit in the Shin Shin Mei. He's going to say, don't get lost in emptiness. Don't get lost in equanimity. 
but neither fall into the opposite. Do both at the same instant. Okay, let's continue from that. I would sure, I hope, I think you would prefer if I continued at this point. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. Master Dogen quoted this in the Fukan Zazenki. If you wish to see the truth, then hold no opinion for or against. Again, a radical statement. Impossible unless you're a corpse in the grave. We all have preferences. That's what makes us not the stone in the garden. We're human beings. We're sentient beings. We're choosing beings. How can we have no opinions? But he's saying, hold no opinion. The struggle of likes and dislikes is a disease of the mind. When this deep meaning of things is not understood, the mind's essential peace is disturbed to no avail. And this is where these kind of Taoist flavorings met Buddhism perfectly, because the Buddha spoke about dukkha is desire, which dukkha, desire frustrated. Dukkha is a word from the earliest Buddhist teachings that means something like uh, dissatisfaction or disappointment or uh, even um, that feeling that you get when you want X and life gives you Y. You want to go left and life pushes you right. And the Taoist said, yeah, go with the flow, drop all desires. The, the Chinese values on this and the Buddhist teachings met perfectly. And when you do drop desire, and ex that means you're accepting all things radically as they are, then you're free of dukkha. And this is what we practice in Zazen, because we sit Zazen, Shikantaza, with the attitude that when we're sitting Zazen, Zazen is complete. It is the completion of all we desire because we desire to sit is the only place to be in the universe, the only thing to do. By sitting with such attitude that the only thing we desire is to do what we're doing, we can taste this radical equanimity and suddenly all the things going on in life, and I got a couple of things going on in my life too, I'll tell you in a little bit, are okay. Somehow, they're not okay, don't get me wrong, they're problems. Out of the blue side lens, <laughs> but on the red side lens, there's a big okay, they are what they are. So when you put down the aversions and the attractions, the likes, the dislikes, the desires, there is the minds like vast space. Master Dogen also quoted that in the Fukan Zazengi. Can you still hear me? Okay. I would prefer that we, Zoom was uh, always uh, better, but you see, even that. The small things, the good things in life, we're filled all day with things we love and things we don't. Extra. Indeed, it is due to our, let me start that again. The way is perfect like vast space, where nothing is lacking and nothing is extra. And what do I always tell you about Zazen? Sit Zazen with the attitude that there is not one darn thing to add to this, not one darn thing to take away. I often say, are you having a bad day of Zazen? It's still perfect Zazen because we never sit with an attitude of Zazen. 
this is bad zazen because you're picking and choosing you're doing exactly what he's telling you not to do sit without picking and choosing even when it's bad zazen zazen is always complete with nothing lacking even on those you know those days right we sit with such attitude because of what is written here the way is perfect like space zazen is perfect like space the whole world is perfect like space did you know that this whole messy chaotic disaster of a world with all that's going on you know this stuff is going on there in the news it's perfect like space how can that be it's a mess the left eye the red side out of the right side know this attitude that there is not one thing to add or one thing to take away what do you mean i got stuff to do i got problems to fix yes out of the side not out of the blue let me give you my my story today. Now, uh, there are things I think that viscerally causes fear, for example, or causes sadness. And we would be we would be robots, rocks or robots, machines if we didn't feel this. So right now, let me say my big problem is this. I'll 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 I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you about it. My son Leon's going to school in the United States. He's in college. He's having a little trouble. He's struggling. May ask him to take a leave of absence for a year. I think the experience has been a bit overwhelming for him. Okay? That's the thing I'm dealing with. What does that lead to for me? I wake up in the middle of the night and I feel, I don't know, a little disappointed at myself. Did I force him to go there? I got all these things going on in my head. Uh, I'm a little fearful for my kid. You know, what did I do? I don't want him to, you know, have a bad time. You feel when you're a parent and your kid is not happy about something. You, you feel it, right? When we feel loss, um, you, you feel it in your heart too. Uh, a friend of mine uh, passed away. Sadness, right? When I was sick, uh, you feel fear sometimes. It's wired into the brain, okay? I would be not human i would not want to be someone who didn't feel those things it's a hard time i feel bad it's hard okay at the same moment over here from these years of practice there is not one thing lacking this is the Tao, the way it flows this is the way we go this is life Toss out your arms like someone on a river and let it carry you where it will. On the blue side. I don't want to be completely on the blue side. And the Shinjin Mei is going to say, don't stay completely on the blue side. You're going to be lost floating in the river. Get, you got to get back to the complexities of life, but don't get lost. And this is why we come to Zen practice or any Buddhist practice, right? We're lost in the world of aversions and fears and hates and sadness and depression and pain. Old. Right? So then we think, okay, now I gotta run completely to the other side. Oh, I gotta be in the place where there's no problems. Everything's complete and peace. World, everything's perfect. The Shin Shim is gonna say, you fool. You can't stay there. That's a real place, by the way. There is a place where everything is just what it is and we flow and it is complete. But we also got to keep living in the other side. How do we do it? Open both your eyes, my friend, and see the world with clarity. If you mess this up even a little, as he says, heaven and earth are infinitely apart. You're, you're a mile off like that. Okay. All right, let's uh, get back to it. Now, this is where he starts going and say it's, it's both, okay? So he said, the way is perfect like vast space where nothing is lacking, nothing is extra. He didn't say a little bit lacking. 
He didn't say a little bit extra. He said, no, there's something perfect with nothing lacking in the whole universe, not one atom out of place, nothing extra. Indeed, it is due to our choosing and rejecting, our wanting and hating, right? That we do not see that. We need to have radical equanimity. But then he says, but live neither in the entanglement with things, chaotic blue side, world of likes and dislikes and all the busyness we must deal with, live neither in the entanglement with things, nor passively in emptiness. Somehow be in the noise and know the stillness and silence. Be in the chaos and know the quiet and unmoving. The Chinese, I believe, uh, Brad, uh, Wu Wei Wu, something like moving. I get my tones all wrong, Brad. Don't tell. I don't. Up, down. There's all these tones in Chinese. I never got those. Okay, shh. I don't know. Wu Wei Wu, Wu Wei Wu, something. It's a, something like that. Moving, non moving is one way to say it. Silence, non silence. Or Dogen says thinking, non thinking, like that. Okay? Thinking and the non thinking. Preferences, no preferences. Choices, lightly held, no choices like that. Live neither in entanglement, strangled by things, nor passively in emptiness. Be serene without striving activity in the oneness of things, and such erroneous views will disappear by themselves. But when you try to stop activity to achieve passivity, your very effort fills you with activity. Uh, when you try to be peaceful, it's darn hard to be peaceful. I like to use the example of if you ever take water and you've shaken it, right? You're shaking it, it's got waves and tangles. This is your, your brain in the world all messed up. You're shaking this, this jar of water, okay? And then you try to calm it down by hitting it with your hand. Waves down. Did you go, could you imagine going to the ocean down there, right? You're just gonna make more. Right? What do you do? How do you calm the water? You put it down, do nothing. Just sit. Okay? So then the water gets all calm and still. That is beautiful. But well, wait a second, we got to get back to life. That means that we need waves and we need ripples. That's what life is. The Shin Shin Mei is telling you, the still water is still there, ever present in the waves and rivers. The point is not to get the water perfectly still. That's a nice place to visit. Wouldn't want to live there. Couldn't live there. Right? Nor do we want the chaotic water. Blah, blah, bouncing up and down our mind, the world, chaos, tangle, fears, sadness. Oh, my God. Right? Nor do we want to hit it down. Get down there. Get life. Get calm. Life. Get Sit still, do nothing, but then realize that the waves and the ripples are the still water. The water has gone nowhere. The movement, the noise is the silence. This is our practice. When you try to stop activity to achieve passivity, your very effort fills you with activity. Now here he says it. As long as you remain in one extreme or the other, you will never know oneness. Non-duality does not mean that we get beyond all separate things. It's that you realize that the world of separate things is the world of no separation, is the wholeness. The waves are the still ocean. The noise is the silence. The hands on the clock are turning with time. 
this is good for the new years but this there's a still face that does not move timeless unmoving still face and the moving hands of time are the whole thing together don't just get falling into the moving hands and seeing time pass the days pass the years pass don't just try to stay in the timeless place beyond time know that the timeless place and the moving of time are both sided coin not one not two we say okay don't fall into one extreme or the other as long as you remain in one extreme or the other you will never know oneness those who do not live in the single way fail in both activity and passivity know the passivity that is activity know the activity that is passivity know the doing that is still your stillness in your heart Heart, shall we say? There's a good way to look at it. Your body's moving, your mind has to move, but somewhere, in, but you also know the timeless face. You have to make choices. Things make you sad or afraid, but you also know something that's complete and beyond fear as one. Those who do not live in the single way fail in both activity and passivity, assertion and denial. Now, here's the famous closing lines we will finish with today. To deny the existence of things is to get stuck in existence. To assert the emptiness of things is to turn away from emptiness. That's one way to translate this. To get lost in the division of things, this world of separate things that conflict, some of which please us, some of which don't, some of which we want to grab more of, some of which we wish to push away. To get lost there is actually to be a prisoner. To try to push them away is to be stuck in existence. To deny the existence of these things is to be really stuck by them to think emptiness oh okay emptiness is what i want to be just in the whole one even my separate sense of a separate self kind of dissolves into the wholeness of all things but if that's where you try to be you're actually kind of turning away from the true meaning of emptiness because the separate things are the wholeness and the wholeness are the separate things even the tensions and conflicts of life are the peace that's beyond i like to say the peace beyond all broken pieces you see so we'll close on that today by saying my friends know the world blue side on the left red side on the right open both eyes and know the world both these ways when we sit zazen this is the reason we sit in the completion and wholeness of just sitting all things as they are okay and i know you would prefer that i stop talking now so i will um any questions using this one wonderful technology where we have uh, folks uh, as close as right behind me and uh, all on the other side of the world? Anybody?